Are you ready to start a fire? Yeah. All right, here we go.
in your house, under your banner, under your name, to sing, Worthy are you, Lord. Lord, we do believe what we sang just then. Lord, even if, no matter what comes, you're still God and you're still in control. And so, God, we just ask you to take control of this service right now during the preaching of your word. God, that you would pierce hearts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that people's lives would be eternally changed because of what's said here. Father, I pray that the enemy be bound this morning. I pray, God, with every fiber of my being, Lord, that no one leave here deceived, but everyone leave here eyes wide open, hearts wide open, Lord, to you. Father, have your way in every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've entitled this message, Things Are Not As They Appear. Things Are Not As They Appear. Uh, let me just say this. God gave me this word. I, I was, uh, while we were off on vacation, I was uh, sitting around looking at my Bible and, and saying, God, you know, we, we've committed to preach through the whole uh, month of March and to preach on salvation. And what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say when I go back to Pleasant View? Uh, on the 26th. What do you want me to share with them? And God gave me this word very clearly. And I believe with all my heart this morning, I'm just going to be honest. I, 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 I don't just step out there like this a lot of times, but I believe that God wants to open someone's eyes this morning. I believe that God wants to open someone's eyes to the reality of their spiritual condition because things are not as they appear. And I say that because uh, we, we have a saying that, 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 that we talk about quite often at my place of employment at the bank. And, and, and one of the things is perception is not reality. Most of the time we're talking about customer service. You know, the customer's perception of, uh, of good customer service may not be reality because they may be wanting us to do something we're not able to do. When I'm talking about salvation this morning, I want you to understand some folks have a perception about salvation. That's just not true. Matter of fact, some folks have a perception about their own salvation that's just not true. And if God were to speak to you this morning, what He'd want to do is show you the reality of salvation and how you have to have your salvation. See, according to the Bible, Jesus' reason for sharing this parable, this story, is that there were uh, those who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous and they were looking down, they were despising other people. They were believing in their hearts that they were in right standing before God when in reality all they had was a mere form of righteousness. That's self-righteousness. And you might say, how does that happen, Brother Jeff? How in the world can that happen? That someone could perceive that they're saved or come to this false sense of reality that they are saved and in reality they don't really know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, how can what they perceive about their salvation just not be true? I, I, there's three major points I derive from this text this morning. Number one, <laughs> some have a false perception because they have allowed others to identify them. They've allowed others to identify them. So what do you mean by that, Brother Jeff? Look at verse number 10. First of all, who are we dealing with this morning? We're dealing with two men. Two separate men, two different men. Uh, they're not anything alike. We can tell by their prayers they're not anything alike. But here's the thing. The Bible identifies one as what? A Pharisee. <coughs> and the other one as a publican. That's not a Republican, by the way. So if you are a Democrat this morning, don't get mad. I think the Bible's got some kind of bias towards Republicans or something. That's a tax collector, okay? That's a little preacher humor. You'll be okay. You'll get it in a couple days. Uh, but... It's a public and it's a tax collector. And, and so you got you got a, a Pharisee who let's let's talk about how they've been identified. Because the point is is some have false perception because they've allowed others to identify them. See, Pharisees, they were identified as the religious people of uh, of the day, of Jesus' day. They were by all appearances this. They were by all, by all appearances, the outward, the show, they were what? They were the most godly. They were the most dedicated. They were the most influential people, religiously speaking, of Jesus' day. That's how the world had identified them. Yeah. 
Matter of fact, the Pharisees wanted that perception. And they made sure that the way that they went about their business and about uh, their, their religious activities, they made sure that folks had all eyes on them and that people had that identification of the Pharisees being the religious do-gooders, the religious right of the day. But what did, what did the Son of God have to say about the Pharisees? Well, if you go to Matthew chapter 23 and you begin to read, you find that Jesus had some awful things to say about the Pharisees. Matter of fact, several times he pronounces, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why did he say that? Why did he say woe? Judgment. He had judged them. He had, he had looked into the heart of the matter. What does he say in verse number 27 here when he looks into the heart of the Pharisees of the day? He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like unto wide sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanliness. <coughs> and here's the thing. So folks come to church, and they huddle with the church, and they identify with the church, and they work, work in the church, and they worship in the church, and they are involved in the activities of the church. And so the world, or even the church, has identified those people and said, hey, they're, they're religious people. They're always here. They're always working. They're always doing something. They're influential people in the church. And so uh, they must be Christians because they are so dedicated to the church. Amen. That's not what Jesus said about them, is it? Jesus said it looks great. On the outside, from all the outward appearances, everything looks great, looks like it's in order, but when you get down to the heart of the matter, it's all out of kilter, it's all out of whack. There's uncleanliness, there's filthiness, there's all types of sin going on in the dark places of the heart. And it's pretty outside, but inwardly, there's no life. He compared them to wide sepulchers. There's a reason that he compared them to wide sepulchers. It's because they had some beautiful tombs back in those days, but listen to me. Behind the doors to those tombs was still death. Hello? Behind the doors to those tombs still existed no life. And so no matter how the Pharisees had been identified in that day, Jesus was saying it doesn't matter because what is in you is not what it takes to have eternal life. Now, Brother Jeff, I just don't know about that. Listen, Jesus, in that same passage in Matthew 23, if you go and read it, He tells them that they compass land and sea about to make one proselyte. In other words, to make someone else a, a, a convert, a, a religious do-gooder, make somebody just like yourself, uh, just to, to make one proselyte. You compass land and sea. And He said you make them twofold more the child of hell. Not only could they not point others to, to heaven, they were not going to heaven themselves. Now, Brother Jeff, that's, a, that's, that's heavy. True. But it's what the Bible says. And sometimes the word is heavy. But some people have a false perception about their salvation because people have told them that they're a Christian. Oh, you have to be a Christian. You work in the church. You have to be a Christian. You do this, you do that. Listen. I, 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 you think, Brother Jeff, does this stuff really happen? Listen, I'll tell you about a story. Didn't happen to be a person, but happened to a good friend of mine preaching a revival. Gave the invitation. The pastor's daughter walked the aisle during the invitation, weeping and crying. Came right to the altar, bowed down to pray. Preacher stepped down and, and, and that had been preaching and said, you know, what can I do for you? How can I pray for you? She said, I'm lost. I need to get saved. She's just weeping uncontrollably. Well, he thought it was a great opportunity to allow her father, who was a pastor, to lead his daughter to Christ. The pastor came on, he called the pastor over, said, your daughter needs Jesus. Lead her, lead her to Jesus, lead her to Jesus. And he stepped back on the platform and left the man to talk to his daughter. You know what the man stepped down there and told his daughter? I was there the night you got saved. You don't need to get saved. I was there the night you prayed to receive Jesus Christ. That's what he said. You don't need to get saved. And she quit crying. And she gathered herself up and said, yeah, and went back to her seat. Does that woman say today? I have no idea. But I know this. You can't allow someone else to identify you. 
You have to identify with Christ. Amen. You have to make the decision that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You have to come to the place where you realize that it's not your righteousness that's going to get you through the gate. It is the righteousness which comes from Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right. Two men, a Pharisee, the other one, a publican. <laughs> what they say about the publicans of those days, how did they identify the publicans of those days? Well, you, you can kind of tell from the prayer of the Pharisee. He said, I thank God I'm not like this man. Thank God I'm not like that guy. But these, these were the tax collectors and they were hated. They were hated by the people of Jesus' day first and foremost because of their employment, because of what they were. They were, they were most of the time Jewish people who were working for the Roman government taxing the people in Jerusalem and all those areas. And listen, they, they, their game was this. They had a certain amount they had to collect for the Roman government. Anything they could collect out of the people above that, they got to keep for themselves. So not only did people hate them because they were aligned with the Romans, but they hated them because they were taking advantage of the people. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? it sounds pretty bad that they're deceptive and dishonest and they're, they're, they're doing all these bad things. I mean, we see this picture in the story of Zacchaeus when Jesus comes to Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus is just a little guy and he's climbed up in that tree and he's wanting to see Jesus and Jesus is like, get down from there. I'm going to your house today. And he's like, uh, my house? <laughs> I mean, Zacchaeus couldn't believe that Jesus is going to his house because you know what he is? He's a publican. He's a tax collector. He's taking advantage of people. He's wrong with people. Matter of fact, he gets so repentant over the fact that the son of God wants to come to his house that he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay back more than I took. You know what? If God gets a hold of somebody here in this building this morning and changes your heart, you want to do you want to you want to pay back more than you've taken from people too. Right. You, you want to get right before God and repent of your sins, and you want to go to people you've wronged and make things right. You want to get things straightened out, not just between you and God, but between you and man. Because listen, your relationship to people absolutely affects your relationship with God. Amen. What did Jesus have to say about those identified as publicans? Because we might look at that and think, well, Jesus probably felt the same way, right? No, he didn't. Matter of fact, one of his disciples was a publican. What? Yeah, Matthew chapter 9. In verse number 9, it says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, which is the tax booth. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, Matthew left a lucrative career, even though it was deceptive and dishonest, he left a lucrative career to follow Jesus Christ. What does this tell us about? Well, if we go on down, we, we read that Jesus then went and ate with some folks who were publicans and get this, sinners. <laughs> As if publicans were a special kind of sinner. They ate with the publicans and the sinners and, and he's hanging out with them and people are like, what are you doing? You're hanging out with these people? I mean, he could have just looked at them and been like, yeah, Matthew's one of my disciples. Just called him away from the tax book a few minutes ago. Do you know what he said? Who was he after? He wasn't after the righteous. Because those who are well don't need a physician, do they? Them that are sick. Publicans knew whether they were deceitful. Matthew knew he was deceitful. You know what? You know what it tells about what it, what it tells about God's view of these people. Even though the world had identified them as these awful, deceptive sinners, do you know what it tells us when Jesus calls Matthew as a disciple? It tells us that even though the world had written them off, even though that the world had cast them aside, that Jesus looked at those who, by all accounts, the world had written off, and He said, "Guess what? I love you, and I believe." You are redeemable, and I believe that you are usable, and you are you can be a vessel for Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Two men identified <laughs> different ways by the world, looked at differently by Christ. So some have false perceptions because they've allowed others to identify them. But the second thing is, some have false perceptions because they have identified other people's sins. Did you notice that in verse 11? As this man's praying. What a great prayer, by the way. I mean, can you imagine standing in God's house? Could you imagine if we call somebody to pray right now? 
And you just think of the worst sinner you can right now, because everybody can do it. Everybody's got it in their mind what the worst sinner in the world is. And can you imagine someone who's caught in that sin for us to call on someone to pray and then to stand in their feet and say, Dear God, I am so thankful that I'm not like Brother So-and-so sitting over on the other side of the Or, or, or worse yet, what if it was someone who wasn't brother so so What if it's someone who just lost his last year's Easter game? They just lost, just lost, lost, lost. Don't go Jesus. Uh, came to church just hoping that, that they might find some hope. And somebody stands up, recognizes them, and stands up and prays and says, well, Dear God, Lord, I, I just don't know if the building's going to fall in. So-and-so's in the building today. Me and Melissa went to church one time. As a matter of fact, it will be 10 years ago, May the 20th. You say, how do you know that, Brother Jeff? Because 10 years ago, May 19th, I got married. I didn't go to church on Sunday morning the next morning. Oh, Brother Jeff, I went to church Sunday night. Me and your brother Ronnie preached, and we went to church. And I kid you not, the preacher stood up and began to pray and called people by name from the pulpit. And I thought, oh, my word. <laughs> I hope they're not here. <laughs> You talk about confrontational evangelism. Y'all think I'm a little bold sometimes. Hello, you start calling people by name, naming their sins and naming their name from the pulpit, and everybody gets nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We've done that, right? Because we've identified other people's sins. What did he say in verse 11? He said, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this other thing. You know, here's, here's, the, here's the problem, folks. We have, we have convinced ourselves that our sin is not the same as everybody else's sin. Our sin's not as bad. Our sin is not as dirty. Our sin is not as ugly. And can I just tell you that that is foolishness and that does not line up with God's Word? That God doesn't accept one ounce of your sin. And if it was not for the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ has been put on, on many of our accounts, listen, we couldn't even stand in the presence of a holy God. Amen. I, I can't even approach a holy God in my sin. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute, Brother Jeff. What do you mean you can't approach a holy God in your sin? He can't fellowship with sin, folks. That he is light and there is no <laughs> darkness at all. Zero period. Zilch. No sin with God. And you know why Jesus had to go to the cross and die? So that he could present spotless, sinless blood before a holy God so that we could even talk to him. Go back and live like the Jews did in the Old Testament. You couldn't even approach God. You couldn't get near the holiest of holies because if you did, you'd die. Now, because of the blood of Jesus, we can approach Him. And, and listen, we, we ought not approach Him in self-righteousness. We ought to approach Him in humility. What do you mean, Brother Jeff? Well, He's not convinced that His sin is the same as others. Some folks think they're going to heaven because they're not as bad as some of the things they're seeing on TV. You hear me? They're not as bad as some of the things they're seeing on TV. I'm not like these people. That's what this guy's praying. They didn't have to be back then. He's walking around the streets with his religious garb on, acting like the do-gooder that the world had identified him as. And listen, he's observed all these men involved in all these other type of activities, and he's going, I'm not as bad as them. And every time he turned the TV on and said, well, I'm not as bad as them. Listen, their sin, their sin is the same before God as your sin. And your sin, it, your sin just as much put Jesus on the cross as anybody else's. Galatians 6 3 warns us about this mentality. It says, For if a man think himself to be nothing, or to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It warns us. It's so easy to think that we're not like these people. We're deceiving ourselves, though, when we miss the sacred truth that's found in this book, in this Bible here, that says our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. We are nothing. I am absolutely nothing apart from Jesus Christ. 
So who, who is it that has infiltrated our, our churches and infiltrated our Christianity and, and told us that because we are better than some, that we are going to heaven? It's the devil. Jesus identified the enemy this way in John 8, 44, when he said, You're of your father the devil, and the lesson of, the father, of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's the father of all lies. The devil's a liar. He is fathering lies. He's producing lies. And listen, the biggest lie, I want you to hear me this morning. The biggest lie that has ever been believed in church is that you are okay because you are not like those people. You're not as bad. You've not sinned the sins that are worthy of God's wrath. They have sinned in a way to provoke you, God. This man standing over there in his pride, he's, he's lifting up his eyes to God, saying, I'm, I'm thankful, God, I'm not like these other people. So some have false perceptions because of, they've allowed others to identify them. Some have false perceptions because they have identified other people's sins rather than their own, right? And then some people have false perceptions because they have identified their religious acts. Because his prayer doesn't end with, I think, I, I think God, I'm not like these other people. You know what he says next in verse number 12? <coughs> this is what he said, I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He parades his religious sacrifice as proof that he is right with God. I've done this. I've done that. We hear this so often. You ask somebody, are you saved? I go to church. Great. That's a good place to start. You might actually find Jesus if you go to church. Are you saved? Brother Jeff, I go to church and I read my Bible. Great. If you read the Bible, there's a chance you might encounter Christ. Are you saved? Brother Jeff, I go to church, I read my Bible, and I give when I go to church. I realize that it takes money to do ministry, so I give when I go to church. Great. We'll be able to keep the lights on this week. Those things have absolutely nothing to do with whether you know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship. <coughs> Yet what the devil has sowed into the minds of people is that because they give <coughs> and because they give and because they, they, they do religious things, that they're okay. Somebody may remember this. Uh, some of y'all haven't been here long enough to know this, but some of y'all may remember this. One time I preached a sermon I talked about how People can get religious and they think that, you know, I'm religious, I'm good, I'm saved. And, and, and I said, you know, we could start a religion tomorrow. You probably wouldn't want to join, but we do it. And we could just start this shoe licking religion. Every morning you just take your shoe, lick the bottom of it. That'd be religious. <laughs> Don't think it'd do you much good. No, it wouldn't think it happened. But we could all participate. We could go around and say, hey, we're part of this cool religion. Tell somebody back, they'd be like, you are crazy. You've lost your mind. <clears throat> Folks, understand, it's not religious repetition. It's not what I, 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 I have done. But this is what the Bible says about, about being saved and about coming to know Christ. In Titus 3, verses 3 through 6, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hate, Hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, notice that, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost.
Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Listen, if you are redeemed today, it is not because of anything you have done. Your salvation is not obtained that way. It is not kept that way. You will not get through the gate one day that way if you have done and based it on you. It has to be based solely on Jesus Christ. Yet many folks today, listen, this is the position of many folks today, they are convinced that their sin is overlooked and that their salvation is secure because of what they have done or are presently doing. Listen, it takes a real relationship with a real Savior that died on the cross for people to go to heaven. No amount of religious activity will get you through the gate. We won't stand up there on judgment day and be like, but God, I gave and I gave and I gave and God, but I did and I did and I did. Listen, I know this to be true. This will happen. Mark my word. Pastors will die and go to hell. Now, Brother Jeff, that just can't be. They pastored the church. They took care of God's church. Listen, some of them are not saved. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't know how to point people to heaven. If it was a two before, he would have crossways across the face. <laughs> <laughs> so you really believe that, Brother Jeff? Yeah, there's people out there who are teaching these kind of things, and I'm telling you it's not right today. And they're telling people that they'll get to heaven with them. Yeah, so see, you'll go to heaven. Go to church, you'll go to heaven. Just, just enjoy <laughs> life. God wants you to be happy, and you'll go to heaven. Well, God wants you to be holy. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be sanctified, set apart, different. Yeah. God wants you to be something that the world is not. And not so you can beat upon your chest and say, oh, look at me, how much better am I? It's so that you can recognize the benevolent hand of a holy God that gave His one and only Son so that you can be saved. And so that you in turn can go and touch another life who in turn can, can come to the same realization and be gloriously saved. Amen. Not so you can sit soaking sour in this sanctuary. So that you can be redeemed and sit on the road to glory and in turn impact other people's lives. There it is. So what has to happen this morning? Perception has to be traded for reality. You have to lay down the perception. Well, I thought, I thought, I thought. You have to trade it for what will cause you to know, to know, to know. Verse 13 and 14, we see the different man praying. This is what happens with this man. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. He started beating himself on the chest. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Listen to what Jesus said. I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Notice the humility and the sorrow of the public. He knew what he was. He didn't just know what he was because the world had told him. He, he didn't just know what he was because he could find a worse sinner than himself. He didn't just know what he was because he had some sacrifice toward God to offer as evidence. He was convinced that he was a sinner. And he was not only convinced of that truth, he was convinced that God alone could forgive him. He doesn't say, God help me to be a better person. He doesn't say, God, help me to give more to the church. He doesn't say, God, help me so that I will live better than most. He cries out to God and says, God, be merciful to me. God, show me mercy. Give me what I don't deserve. I, I, don't, I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve it. But please, God, give that to me. One of the most obvious examples of this happening to somebody. 
where they had a perception of themselves and God had to give them a reality check was King David. King David got caught up in adultery. Led him to have a man murdered. He lied. He was deceptive throughout the process. And he thinks everything's cool. Everything's good. God sends his messenger, Nathan the prophet, to talk to him. And to confirm him. And to, in essence, do this to point his finger and say, you got to see it in your life. You're the one. You're the man. You're the one that has long God. And when David traded perception for reality, the Bible tells us that he began to cry out to God. And this is just a, a snippet of what he said. But Psalms 51, 1 and 2, it kind of aligns with this public. He said, what he said, he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David began crying out, God, forgive me. You know what, for somebody today, if you trade perception, for reality, you're going to have to cry out. Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, take my sin away. Listen, He can because He sent His Son so that you can be. Who's the Bible say when we're justified that day? Not the Pharisee. Not the religious man of the day. But the publican. The one who was willing to acknowledge his sin and admit his need. And he went away justified. What does that mean? It means he went away in a right relationship with God. So what are you, what are you saying, brother? Listen, if you are to leave this place today in a right relationship with God, you've got to come to reality with where you are. You've got to come to reality with what sin exists in your life. You got you got to get rid of some lies you bought from the devil, and most importantly, you got to come to Christ without delay, without delay. This eyes can bow your heads and close your eyes all across this auditorium. Nobody's looking around.